Yes, medical students about their researches. We'll be talking to four different medical students actually. Uh, the first will be Lina Al Sharif on her research about public awareness of do not resuscitate. And of course, um, uh, the second student, Maha Shalqi, her research is ethics of medical publication. And followed by Hatim Al Hatim with his research, Miss. Um, sorry, mis, uh, misperceptions of tobacco smoking and finally uh, nicotine dependence among uh, Saudi citizens is a research by Jihad Al Harbi. And of course, uh, joined with them, they will be their professor, Dr. Mohammed Al Sheif, uh, joining the, his students about their medical researches. So, very different uh, researches they've been doing, um, mm -hmm. and uh, they'll be talking, of course, about the conclusions they've reached with their various researches. Indeed. And uh, before that, we are going to take a look at the tweets that uh, we've compiled this um, tonight. So let's have a look at those now, and then we'll go to our first topic this evening. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to your viewers. Those were uh, some of the tweets that we've compiled on our Twitter topic for the evening. And now uh, we'd like to uh, introduce our uh, main topic for the evening, which is students in medical researches. We're joined by Dr. Mohammed Ashif, the consultant internal medicine of thromboembolism and vascular medicine, um, joining us along with his student, uh, Lina Al Sharif, and with her research, Public Awareness of DNR, Do Not Resuscitate. Dr. Mohammed, welcome to the program. Yes. It's a pleasure you having much. you again. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, Dr. Lina or future Dr. Lina? Future Dr. Future Dr. Lina. Welcome to the program. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Mohammed, beginning, uh, I'd like to start by asking you about uh, being the advisor of all these medical researches. How do you evaluate uh, medical researches in general within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this it's uh, our very important uh, program. Uh, I think uh, the current position of Saudi Arabia in the scientific research is uh, promising uh, and uh, we are rated among the Arab countries as the top countries but we are uh, 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 level of Middle East we are lagging behind uh, Israel uh, sorry Palestine or say Israel and uh, Turkey as well as we are lagging behind the Western community North America and Europe but Saudi Arabia compared to Arab countries we are rated as the top uh, after Egypt uh, and this rated uh, or uh, evaluated based on uh, certain variables, the publications. Mm -hmm. So how uh, the number of publications, so per year, and not only the uh, amount, is the quality of publications. Because you can uh, publish a lot, but it has low impact mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. changing the clinical practice. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the importance of publication and 
also were uh, uh, published in highly, uh, we call it journals, medical journal with high impact factor, means the number of readers. And if you write a research and look for references, you look for high impact journals because how many times this article cited by other mm -hmm. uh, articles. Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, our you know, current position is embarrassing. Uh, it's uh, uh, promising. That's, that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, um, to, to ask Dr. Lena, well, the future Dr. Lena, um, how, uh, first of all, do you evaluate um, or did you evaluate public awareness of DNR in the society? Actually, it was reasonable because about around 75% of our respondents have heard the term denatural statistics mm -hmm. and about 50% of, uh, of DNR aware uh, have reached the correct uh, definition of DNR. So around 37.5% are aware of the exact meaning of the DNR. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's interesting. And then, okay, and now um, I'll, I'll go to, to you, Dr. Mohammed, and, and ask you, um, what do you think of the, uh, the, the, the ethical, and how do you rate the, the ethical and uh, the religious implications of do not resuscitate? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, we have to, first of all, understand what does it mean don't uh, resuscitate or DNR, and the new terminology called allow natural death. What does it mean in case of uh, terminal illness or serious disease, uh, the patient uh, wishes not to perform uh, the cardiopulmonary resuscitation, i.e. the chest compression, uh, electrical uh, cardioversion, cardiac shock, uh, and tubing. So this is, we call it heroic or aggressive measures. Sometimes the patient uh, or the relative wishes not to go for these aggressive measures because of the patient already uh, reached advanced uh, terminal illness or advanced stage that is not curable. Mm -hmm. So this is the basic uh, of, it is a pure medical decision, mm -hmm. but however we need to inform the patient and the relatives about uh, this uh, decision. So uh, we have to understand uh, the meaning of DNR yeah. Before we uh, reach to, that's why this is the objective of our research that Lena will speak about. Mm -hmm. uh, there is controversy or ambiguity about DNR, uh, the religious, moral beliefs among Saudi Arabia. So mm -hmm. it is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, this is the, uh, it was this, you know, uh, controversy uh, set uh, the stage for this uh, research. So I guess, doctor, when, when I say, how do you rate it? What I, um, I'm asking is, is it, is it quite highly, uh, uh, most people, most Saudis uh, averse to uh, DNR? Okay, uh, like many... Percentage high against it? Yes, okay, that's uh, in the research, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Lena, what did you find our okay. research that... Uh, so, Ms. Lena, how, if you could answer it first. Mm. There is contra controversy between their opinion yeah. Around half percent of them uh, thought it was against, and yeah. uh, the other ha uh, half percent thought it's not against Islamic regulation. And okay. it's so not it's tomorrow. 50 50. Not yes. Interesting. So now, um, Zlina, if you can, if you can talk to us about your research when you when you first began with the research and and, and the mm -hmm. things, the findings that you found during that research. Uh, actually, uh, we've done two projects with uh, Dr. Mohammed mm -hmm. Ashir, mm -hmm. and uh, we participated. Uh, we presented both of them and student uh, research symposium in our faculty at King Fahad Medical City. And uh, one of them is about uh, this research about the natural state orders. And uh, the other one is uh, a case study about uh, a, a rare disease. And uh, actually we took two months to, um, to finish this research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, now generally when, what, what is the, um, you said that 75% uh, knew about DNR, 50% mm. of those who knew about it were not against it. But what is meant by DNR and, and, and what, it, what, what are the most, if I can ask, if, if, I don't know if you ask your participants about this, but what is their, uh, what you can say, the misconception on DNR? Misconception. Did you find any, uh, any findings on that? I mean, what do we mean by DNR actually? Uh, DNR actually is uh, a medical order to stop resuscitation and the resuscitation itself means uh, it's a medical procedure 
to restore heart and lung function mm -hmm. for arrested patients. And uh, Dr. Mohammed, when people usually, uh, you mentioned before um, when uh, Camille asked you about uh, the, uh, the, the point of the perspective of, of most of our society towards DNR, what is the reason that people feel that it should not be done or, or actually that DNR should be done? Or should not be done. Anyway, it's a very important point. We did not address it, you know, in this current research. Uh, they have misperception uh, about this, you know, order. They think we are uh, doing this not in favor of the patient. Just we don't, we don't want, we just we want to terminate the patient life. It's not the case. Mm -hmm. Actually, this order is uh, in favor of the patient because if you perform this, you know, aggressive or heroic measures, what will be the outcome? Will you able to restore the cardiopulmonary function and the patient back to his uh, pre-disease or before, uh, you know, uh, arrested uh, capacity? So this is important because sometimes you do these, you know, measures, but at the end, the patient will not uh, recover. It will be just uh, in a cubine bed in the ICU with a tube, and uh, medication to raise Due blood to pressure. The lack of oxygen to the brain has done its course. Yes, most definitely. Of the time. And uh, yeah. actually, we are torturing the patient rather than. So, in our community, it's very hard to convince people. We say, uh, we discuss, you know, uh, DNR. They will say, What you are doing? Are you human? I say, Yes, we are human. You want to stop uh, treatment from the patient? Yes, we sometimes we need to stop it. If it is, we reach to a line that we cannot, you know, do more. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Uh, that's why this is the uh, uh, generated this clinical question. What's the perception about mm -hmm. uh, or uh, the knowledge about DNR in our community? Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, that's quite um, an interesting take on, on the topic. And we, we'd like to thank uh, uh, Ms. Lina Sharif for joining us on the program and shedding light on her research and her findings. Um, we, we're now going to go on a report and we'll be, we will be uh, right back after uh, this report uh, still with Dr. Mohammed uh, Ashif who also supervised another student, uh, Maha Sharqi, with her research which is ethics of medical publications. We're going to go on a report and we'll be right back to, uh, to shed light on this other piece of research. Stay tuned. How to research a paper. Got a big research paper? It's not nearly as daunting if you break it down into steps. You will need a good library, a notebook, and internet access. Optional, an expert to interview. Step one, spend your time thinking about what you want your paper to accomplish. Do you want it to prove your viewpoint? Explain the topic? You'll want to have a clear focus before you begin your research. Step two, Make a list of keywords that will be helpful in locating information when you conduct online and offline searches. Step three, go to the library. Yeah, we know, you think you can find everything you need with your laptop, but to get an actual book on a topic, plus find academic papers, journals, and other subscriber-only materials, you'll need to head to a library. If your library doesn't have a book you need, ask the librarian to borrow it from another branch. Step four, Use the library's indexes to find articles in periodicals, like trade journals and magazines. They'll contain the very latest information on your subject. Note your sources carefully as you go along to make the bibliography easier and to prevent plagiarism. Step 5. Okay, now you can do some online research by plugging in those key words you listed at the start. Only take information from reputable sites and organizations. Consider interviewing an expert in the field you're researching. It's a guaranteed way to impress your professor. Step six, while you're researching the facts, don't forget the figures. Find useful statistics. Helpful search words for stats include percent of, census bureau, and survey results. Step seven, don't forget the videos. See if there are any documentaries on your topic. Step eight, organize your research, mull it over, and then start writing. Did you know? One study found that students who frequently used the library got higher ACT scores and performed better on reading and writing exams. Welcome back, everyone. And 
and uh, we are still with Dr. Mohammed Al Sheev, consultant of internal medicine, thrombolism, and vascular medicine of the Department of Medicine, and also with his student uh, Maha Al Sharki, who is doing a research of ethics of medical publication. A welcome back, uh, of course, Dr. Mohammed Al Sheev and Maha. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. For having and. Um, so now we're talking to you, Mahar, about your research on the ethics of medical publication. Yes. Um, to ask, uh, but I will start with you, Dr. Mohammed. And uh, first of all, if you could tell me a bit about how you evaluate the standards of med medical publications. Yes, okay. Uh, so it depends on many uh, variables uh, and the research idea. So research idea is very important. You have to come with something novel or new is not like to duplicate or uh, redundancy of other research. So it have to have something new and uh, the number two, something has impact on the, for medical research, so it has impact on the management of the patient, mm -hmm. uh, on uh, disease, you know, uh, treatment. Number three, that uh, it depends on uh, the quality of research. Sometimes you have uh, the sample size is small, sometimes you have large sample size, sometimes you have something prospective mm -hmm. and, uh, <coughs> and sometimes retrospective. Clinical trial, what we call, so you have experimental and uh, observational. Mm -hmm. Actually, we don't have the proper, you know, setup for experimental uh, research for uh, randomized clinical trials where we enroll large number of patients mm -hmm. to try one medication Again, it's like placebo, not take anything. Actually, we don't have the proper setup. Most of these researches come from uh, like uh, North America or Europe. Mm -hmm. So yeah. our research, yes, we are doing research, but is not up to the high, uh, you know, uh, or international uh, standards. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, so the many variable. This is just to mention some of uh, important factors for to have clinically uh, important research. Well, yeah. now. Um, Ms. Maha, your, your title of your research was Ethics of, of Medical Publication. Why did you choose this topic specifically? Okay, assalamu alaikum. First of all, thank you for having thank me so. on your show and giving me such an opportunity. So to answer your question, uh, we chose this topic because of the constant rise in medical uh, publication worldwide and the misconception about plagiarism and duplication. And in Saudi Arabia, here it has been only uh, been raised this issue since 30 years ago by Dr. Hilal Kashan. And now we would like to know the attitude and behaviors of uh, medical trainees regarding this issue. Yeah. Well, actually, you you're, uh, brought up a point about plagiarism. Yes. So how, how important uh, and how uh, worried should we be um, society for this exact problem that you've just spoken about? Well, uh, as I mentioned, there has been a lot of research published yeah. And uh, we would like to emphasize about uh, the misconceptions about plagiarism and what does it mean exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, our research is about a uh, questionnaire asking students and medical trainees uh, regarding these issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and Dr. Mohammed, how, how, how is, the, um, well, how is the, the attitude towards plagiarism among medical students? How, how have you seen it? We have to define first, you know, plagiarism. Plagiarism is plagiarism, whether it is in the medical field or other fields. Mm -hmm. And uh, literally uh, speaking, like from dictionary, it's like to steal off an idea or words from somebody and pass it off as your own, or uh, taking somebody else's uh, production uh, without uh, crediting the original uh, source. So this is plagiarism is uh, in every field of uh, science. But we are shedding the light on uh, medical uh, field, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, there are other, you know, apart from plagiarism, uh, is the duplication of medical publication. Like you publish in one journal mm -hmm. with like, uh, the title, then you uh, again submit it to another journal, but you change the title as it's a new publication. But in fact, it's the same. This is we call it duplicate publication or self-plagiarism. Sometimes it's yours mm -hmm. and you publish it in one journal, so the copyright goes for that journal. So you take it and you change the title, you submit it to another journal. Yes, it's yours, but it is the copyright goes mm -hmm. for the, uh, I mean, the original uh, journal. I think why we raise this important research, because now, previously, uh, when we were medical student, 
we rely on the textbook, like uh, I will say 10, uh, 15 years ago. Nowadays, you know, the, there is enormous change uh, and, uh, you know, uh, medical education. Now we count in the internet. You can just simply copy and paste mm -hmm. without crediting the original uh, source. That's why we said, oh, this is 30 years ago, as Doctora mentioned, it was like 60% not aware about plagiarism. What about right now, the influence of the internet and others? That's why we raised this in different levels as she student, uh, interns, mm -hmm. because this is after graduation from the medical school and medical uh, resident. And we have interesting result, and Dr. Ma will tell you about it. So, okay? so Ma so, Maha, um, if I could ask you, what are the challenges that you faced during uh, your research? Okay, uh, challenges that I think a lot of researchers face is the lack of database and information regarding such topics. And uh, for us, it, has t uh, it took a long time to collect a lot of data because we had about 260 participants. So we collected from a lot of universities and hospitals. And what are the misconceptions of, of medical publications in general that you found? Uh, I'm guessing from the, quest from yes. the questionnaire you found yes. some. So uh, misconceptions is like um, copying from textbook without acknowledging the resource or translating an uh, Arabic uh, paper to an English and submitting as their own or like uh, taking a research idea without crediting the source. So what, what makes a person claim something is his own when anything you say in a research must be taken from somewhere else. You don't make something up, right, Dr. Mohammed? So, yes. so I in any research, it has to end with references no matter what. Definitely, yes, that's important. So, that's, so basically, as long as you mention all the, all the references, you're pretty much clear from plagiarism. Yes, not only reference, you have to cite the citation, and mm -hmm. the, because if you have a paper with uh, 20 references, we don't know which this is this sentence or paragraph from which reference. So you have to put the citation oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, reference that uh, to highlight this important. Uh, I think the results are very interesting, and not only she may forget that lending, you know, uh, borrowing a good paper from senior uh, student uh, written in the previous semester, and you just pass it off and take it and submit it, submit it as your own, and we found significant uh, finding in this. So when you, f when you say you found a significant finding on this, do you mean that people actually admitted to doing it on the questionnaire, or is there like a plagiarism detection tool that you have? In okay. 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 What was interesting in our result, it showed that there's a high concept of uh, plagiarism and duplication among medical trainees mm -hmm. than was like 30 years back. And I think that was reflected by the addition of ethical course during their medical uh, years of uh, studying. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Ms. Maha Shalqi, thank, thank you very much for sharing your research you with so us much. on the program. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, that was um, uh, medical student Maha Shalqi and her research, which was Ethics of Medical Publication. She was with us for the past 10 minutes sharing information on her research. We're now going to go on a break, and we'll be right back with... Dr. Mohammed Ashif, the consultant in internal medicine of thromboembolism and vascular medicine. And of course, uh, next uh, will be with us his student, Hatim Al Hatim, with his research, which is Misperceptions of Tobacco Smoking. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. The medical school has an outstanding reputation in medical research, particularly around the area of translational research, which is all about bench to bedside research. We aim to have our medical students become aware of what it is we're doing in research terms, what we're good at, and to provide them with opportunities to be part of that. There's lots of different ways to get involved in research at Newcastle and they start teaching you about this in first and second year. Um, they have um, state-of-the-art lectures which are by people who are sort of world-class leaders um, and they're really interesting to sort of hear a bit about what's going on even if you don't really understand it. Newcastle University is an excellent place to do research and there's so many world-renowned centres here um, and it's a really great place with lots of really enthusiastic doctors and, and you know, academics. I really like the fact that in my clinical work I not only see patients but I also develop new um, ideas and answer those ideas with research. 
So I'm not just following guidelines, I'm actually making the guidelines that we use in clinical practice. I think the other thing that's important to say with the area is that we work very closely with the community. So part of the researchers that I'm involved with is based in general practice. And one of the things that's been excellent about the North East is that the people are very generous with their time. And my cohort have now worked with us for, for 10 years and have taken part in now four episodes of the research. Newcastle Medical School is one of the most successful centres for research in the United Kingdom. It has a strong international reputation students who want to um, develop skills um, and, and interests in medical research in addition to being taught as an undergraduate to become a good doctor should come to us. Research is important um, to allow us to you know, continue our um, understanding of diseases and um, illnesses and without continuing this research, especially you know, medical students and people further along the, the line, then we wouldn't be able to um, provide good treatment to patients and we would be able to move forward. Welcome back everyone. And now we have with us still, of course, Dr. Mohammed al Shaif and also uh, another one of his students, Hatem al Hatem, and his research on misperceptions on tobacco smoking. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Mohammed, and welcome, Hatem. Uh, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank, thank you for um, this uh, opportunity for us. It's, it's our pleasure yeah. to have you. And um, so now talking about your research on the misconceptions of tobacco smoking. Yes. Um, first of all, starting with you, Dr. Mohammed, once again, um, if you could tell us what are the common misconceptions in Saudi Arabia on tobacco smoking? Okay, uh, we uh, really chose, you know, research about tobacco because this is unmet need and, you know, tobacco kills uh, one person every uh, six seconds and with uh, six million uh, per year uh, or annually. So that's why we, uh, and it is very prevalent, you know, tobacco uh, use in Saudi Arabia, all, you no, know, sorry, for doctor. One, one person every six seconds, and that is Die from everywhere in the world? Yes, or South every Arabia? day in the world. Everywhere in the world. Okay. So this is really, you can go through, there is a, a website, it's called World Meter for all world statistics, and you see about tobacco smoke, every like five to six seconds, one person die uh, due to, you know, tobacco smoking. Uh, and uh, that's why we have, you know, uh, Choose our research about tobacco and miss, you know, conception or perception about tobacco. Uh, just to mention some, and uh, we'll leave the rest for uh, hat and that people they think that uh, tobacco uh, smoking or cigarette smoking is not uh, a gateway to uh, drug addiction. Mm -hmm. So this is misconception. Mis uh, the other one that smoking light cigarette or we call it low tar cigarette is healthier than smoking a regular cigarette this is another misconception mm -hmm. why we uh, chose misconception because if due to misconception people they will think this is common sense this is low tar or low nicotine it is healthier so it will encourage them to start smoking especially the, among the youth or will encourage them to continue and not think about quitting that's why very important before implementing any anti-tobacco strategy you have to check what's in the mind of a uh, smoker so uh, in order to you know design strategic you know or uh, I mean uh, implementing anti-smoking you know uh, strategy this is just mentioning a few and uh, Dr. Hatem will uh, you know uh, elaborate in our you know research we did very you know great research and he will tell you about it so, so Mr. Hatem if you, you can uh, tell us a little bit more about what you found in your research. Yes, uh, we have specific findings that we found in our research uh, that are uh, specific in our community, such as that uh, there is a, the people do not understand or uh, they have a misperception regarding a smoking that is it a habit or is it an addiction. There is difference between uh, addiction and habituation. Mm -hmm. Habituation work on the psychological level and the behavioral level mm -hmm. more, uh, more commonly. And the addiction work on the biological level uh, more than the uh, habituation. So uh, 
the, our research uh, says that people say that uh, smoking is a habituation, it's a habit, it's not addiction. And uh, the, the medical research says that it's an addiction and it causes specific uh, changes in uh, the, our brain. Mm -hmm. And this cha these changes can lead to uh, addiction more and more on the consequences. In, in fact, actually, <coughs> what, what I've heard, um, Mr. Hatem, is that, um, that smoking is one of the worst addictions that uh, there is in the world. In fact, I've, I've, you can, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard that it's, one, it's worse than uh, cocaine addiction, worse than heroin addiction, worse than so many other drug addictions. Yeah. Nicotine addiction, that is. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, this one puffing one cigarette, mm -hmm. it can lead to addiction, one cigarette. Mm -hmm. And why you mentioned, because once we smoke cigarette, Within five seconds to six seconds, you know the nicotine, yeah. which is the addictive substance in tobacco, reach yeah. to the brain and cross blood brain barrier and stimulate what we call pleasure pathway. Mm -hmm. Pleasure pathway, this is a dopamine, this is a chemical substance that yeah. will give you the rewarding, okay? Mm -hmm. Or uh, then uh, what yeah. happened, uh, it has short lifespan. After one hour, it will go back, you know, the nicotine level in the blood very low, then what will happen? The dopamine will go low, then what happen? You will so crave, you want to have it back again. crave for another cigarette to restore yeah. the nicotine uh, level back to the, uh, then uh, subsequently uh, the dopamine, which is the substance cause, you know, pleasure. That's why it's really yeah. addictive in co and as you mentioned, maybe worse than other, you know, uh, substance uh, abuse. Well, how to, what's the current percentage of, uh, of smokers in the kingdom? Have you, have you gotten a percentage for your research? In a specific a percentage, uh, we couldn't conclude that, but it's one of the common problems, one of the common unsolved major problems in our community, and it should be corrected and need to be corrected because mm -hmm. it can uh, lead our community to an unhealthy lifestyle. So uh, smoking need uh, some anti-smoking campaign, and some awareness to increase the level of awareness in our community. Have you touched up on uh, when, when uh, Dr. Muhammad was talking about, uh, you also talked about people thinking that either it's an addiction yes. or it's a habit. Yes. Does it ever become a habit from the addiction? I mean, because there's always been this widespread thing among smokers saying that if I can quit for three days, I'm quitting forever. Yeah. Yeah, they say that always. Uh, it's, it's a complex thing that it, it is related to a behavioral, uh, psychologic point of view and a biologic point of view, which is addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, as the doctor said, the pleasure pathway and, and, and this uh, explained the addiction uh, in a smoker. But uh, it's a habit due to the behavior and uh, how people uh, react to it. Mm -hmm. And if they say one smoke, if, the, if, a, if a guy say, uh, say, says his friend is next to him, he will smoke. Because mm -hmm. he sees him uh, that uh, that it's uh, if, if you get uh, yourself into a group of friends that they all smoke, yeah, you will end up smoking. The uh, question, you know, was directed the uh, prevalence of you know smoking, you yeah. know, tobacco, and so that we have different, you know, uh, studies. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, all our, you know, uh, epidemiological studies are really underestimating the actual prevalence. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. It was uh, quoted that uh, from uh, 25 to 50 percent uh, and with average 30 percent among male and uh, among female from 5 to 15 and the average is 9 uh, percent. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it is more uh, prevalent uh, than this uh, figure. Mm -hmm. um, it's really very prevalent uh, tobacco smoking in uh, Saudi uh, Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to cl clarify one point that once a smoker thinks this is a habit, mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean habit only is not addiction? Mean they can quit anytime. It's not true. Mm -hmm. they, they, there is one study that hundred you know smokers. They said, oh, we can just quit by strong uh, determination or will uh, mm -hmm. power okay uh, only five percent of them they were able to quit successfully mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. others okay they could not that's why you need mm -hmm. medical you know uh, counseling and you need medications to overcome what we call withdrawal yeah. symptoms because mm -hmm. once you stop 
this, uh, I mean, uh, tobacco smoking, mm -hmm. uh, you will have what we call withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. You will have the urge, psychological and physical, to go back to smoking. Mm -hmm. that, that's why making it difficult. Sure. Yeah. It is part of the, you know, anti-smoking, you know, uh, I mean, uh, strategy or, or program. You yeah. have to explain to the patient this is not only habit. It is mm -hmm. really addiction, okay, in fact. Well, um, uh, Mr. Hatim, I'd like to thank you very much for, for sharing your research with us on the program. Thank you for this opportunity, and I appreciate it. It's our pleasure, and we'd like to wish you the, the best of luck in the future. Thank you, appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. And that was um, um, Dr. Or future Dr. Hatim and Hatim and his research, Misperceptions of Tobacco Smoking. And now we're going to go with the report and we're right back with Jihad Al Harbi and his research, which is nicotine dependence among Saudi citizens. We're going to be uh, going with that report, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Here are guidelines to write your research paper. 1. Determine how much time you have and realistically divide it roughly into several important increments. 5% determining your thesis statement, 5% writing it down, 15% writing an outline of arguments and counterarguments, 25% research, 40% actual writing, and 10% polishing. This is just to give you an idea. You can adjust the time as needed. For example, you may allot more time for research and writing. 2. Decide on your thesis statement. The thesis is the meat, the foundation of your research paper. You want it to be solid and strong. Focus your mind on what you want to say, clarify your idea, and encapsulate it in your mind. As much as possible, make it to be something you firmly believe in. It will be much easier to write about something you believe in your heart to be true, rather than something you doubt. 3. Write down your thesis statement. Make it succinct, clear, and sure. As you move on to writing the outline, write your introduction to make the reader know why you came up with the thesis. Make the introduction interesting, thought-provoking, and attention-grabbing to draw your teacher and the reader into further reading. 4. Write your outline. Think of arguments to support your thesis and write the ideas out in short sentences. Write as fast as the thoughts occur to you. Imagine that you are talking with a friend, convincing him of your point of view, and then write down your line of reasoning. Also, think up of possible rebuttals to your arguments or other points of view and then counter these. Remember, you are writing only the outline, so don't write in paragraphs just yet. Keep items and bullet points in brief. Arrange topics and headings and subheadings as applicable and according to the format prescribed by your teacher. 5. Do your research. This is the usual bottleneck for writers because research can take a long time, especially if you don't know how to work fast and have no idea what you're looking for. This is why it's important to have an outline. Your outline will guide you on specific information you need to find so you don't have to waste time reading lots of useless material. The usual order of things is to study other materials that have been published on your topic. Since you need to produce your research paper fast, you don't have time to go about it the usual way. To do fast research, go to the library and take out books related to your topic. Scan the table of contents of each book, find a chapter that seems related to any of the arguments in your outline, and go to that chapter. Scan it quickly and pick out relevant information for your reference, including citation information. Read the context of the statement, though, to make sure you're not misquoting the author. If you scan and work fast, you can find references for all your arguments in no time. Don't get caught up reading what doesn't apply to your research. 6. Now it's time to write. Flesh out the points in paragraph form by using your outline as a guide. Let the ideas flow and write freely. Explain each argument in turn and respond to counterarguments persuasively with facts and data and with a conclusion supporting your thesis in a convincing way. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are still talking with Dr. Mohammed Al Shif, a consultant of internal medicine and his uh, four students we've had with us this evening. 
uh, talking about their different medical researches. And now we have Dr. Jihad Al Harbi, who has done his research on nicotine dependence among Saudi citizens. Welcome, Dr. Jihad. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for having me, Mr. And thanks, of course, for staying with us, Dr. Mohammed. Yes. And um, continuing now um, talking about nicotine um, dependence upon, uh, among Saudi citizens, um, Dr. Mohammed, um, first of all, how did the university undertake to do research on this particular topic? Yes, uh, I think the, there is a pathway, you know, for any uh, for conducting any research. Mm -hmm. So before you embark on a research, you have to, you know, review literature, and then you design the questionnaire. Then you submit it to uh, uh, what we call IRB or Institution Review Board for approval. Mm -hmm. So it might be approved, might be unethical research. It will be declined. So after you get approval, mm -hmm. then you start, you know, uh, the process or the poll rolling. Uh, actually, uh, we have a lot of ideas, but it's difficult to implement them. So our, you know, great, you know, uh, I would say students mm -hmm. uh, are really highly motivated and they are want to, you know, the, uh, conduct, uh, you know, our, you know, uh, I would say brilliant ideas and translate it from idea to a research, then it will be a, a publication. So it has, it has to go through different milestones, okay, before mm -hmm. the reaching to the final conclusion or publication. Okay? Sure. So then um, now, Dr. Jihad, I'm, I'll move to you and say, how did you come about choosing this particular topic? You know, me and Dr. Mohammed Sheikh, uh, we tried to find a topic mm -hmm. that really related to our society, and it's mm -hmm. very important. As Dr. Mohammed said in the, in the past segment, that. Uh, the nicotine or tobacco use is the leading preventable, preventable cause of death uh, in the worldwide. And yeah. if you can imagine that there is one uh, person dies every six seconds, which is a very high number. So uh, all these factors uh, just give us a signal to start uh, uh, searching about this topic and how, how, how big is this problem in our society. Sure, and as you say, it's preventable. Yes, it's a preventable, preventable disease. Yes. And uh, another thing I'd like to ask you, uh, Dr. Jihad, is um, we know that uh, the effects of tobacco smoking does not show immediately. It's something that takes years and years before you actually see the effects of it. Um, most people don't develop uh, the terrible effects until they're into their middle age, yeah. um, 50s or 60s or, or what, you know, late 40s or whatever. Um, did, did you find in your research exactly how old it is and the different illnesses that a affect us through tobacco smoking? Actually, the aim of our study was to, to figure out the, the, the degree of, of dependence on nicotine in our society. Okay. So uh, we tried to figure out which age uh, or which age group has a significant uh, degree of dependence on nicotine. So, mm -hmm. and we are using an international criteria for this, which called Fagor Storm Tolerance uh, Questionnaires. Uh, we are asking the, our participants before, do you smoke or not? Then he should fill all the questions that, that or just answer all the questions. And at the end of this survey, we, we will we'll just measure the degree of dependency of this person. And this is also related to both uh, sexes as well. So, um, uh, Dr. Jihad, when, when you said nicotine dependence among Saudi citizens as a title for your, for your mm. research, what did you mean by dependence exactly and, and which age group did you find most, most dependent yeah. on nicotine? We are relying on this Fagor storm and there are, there are questions. Each question has score mm -hmm. and then at the end we have to calculate e uh, all the, the scores. Then we'll, we'll give, uh, give the patient the, the result. will be from 1 to 10. 8 to mm -hmm. 10, which, which, uh, which is the highest degree. Dependous, yeah, yeah he ha this person is in danger, actually. Wow. Yeah. In and danger of not being able to quit or in danger of actually taking too, many, too much nicotine a day? Too much nicotine, actually. Okay. And for and age, which age, which age group did you Age group, uh, in our study, we found that the, 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 the most uh, uh, age group has in, have, having a, a, a nicotine dependence, it, uh, they are people who are from 25 to uh, 35. Mm -hmm. They are more uh, dependent to nicotine. And, uh, and Dr. Mohammed, what's your take on that? Yeah. Like informal, you know, transmission that, oh, we are heavy smokers, our population. Yeah. So we have to prove this concept to do, you know, uh, we design, you know, uh, 
a study uh, using validated questionnaire, that's Fagar Storm questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And actually, as mentioned, our, you know, uh, it really was consistent with our, you know, uh, hypothesis mm -hmm. that we are really heavy smokers with high nicotine dependence. We did this study and found that our study between uh, eight, uh, I mean, between six to eight, which is uh, highly uh, or uh, highly dependent on nicotine. Uh, there is extremely high, which is uh, eight to ten. Mm -hmm. What does it mean if you have this score? It means mm -hmm. you are uh, you are not controlling the uh, nicotine. And nicotine is controlling you, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really difficult to quit the patient. That's why you need uh, not only uh, the I will say uh, behavioral changes. He need uh, medications to help him to or to alleviate the withdrawal symptoms. Like we have nicotine replacement therapy. Yeah, yeah. We have other, you know, uh, treatment uh, methods, okay, available. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the impact. Uh, you have to, before, you know, uh, I mean, counsel the patient to quit smoking, you have to measure this. So yeah. to know what standpoint you can, how aggressive you should go, yeah. how uh, successful uh, your attempt. So uh, we did this study and I think we have significant uh, finding. And one of the questions, that gets significant, you know, finding that uh, smoking, because one of the criteria, you know, just to mention some of them, that how heavy you smoke, one pack or two, or less than 10, and uh, how, uh, uh, how soon you smoke after you wake up. This is important. So heavy All smokers. All these factors play a part or, in yes, the, how have you high, dependence. High nicotine dependence. Once they wake up, they take this first cigarette within five minutes. This has significant correlation that yes, this is telling our patient yes. has high nicotine addiction. Well, um, uh, Dr. Jihad Al-Harbi, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing this, uh, this research with us. And Dr. Muhammad, I'd like to thank you very much for, um, for uh, bringing your students and having them uh, expose their, their research uh, with us on the program today and, and shedding light on, on these issues that really should be taken into consideration from the society. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you for inviting us. And I'm really, you know, grateful for my uh, students. And there are four, but they are among uh, 25, you know, uh, students. Uh, and I, I think they will be the, the future, you know, physicians. Uh, and they are really promising. And I'm quite uh, happy from their performance. Okay. Well, we, we saw their researches, and, and we'd like to thank them very much for, for, the, great, uh, for the great effort they've done. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we are running out of time. Um, we had uh, a number of, of the students of... Uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed Ashif exposing their different researches, all important for uh, different aspects of society. But we're running out of time. News coming up next. Uh, on behalf of myself, Wadi Dasaleh, and my colleague Kamil Javier, along with Director Bedr Nizi, we'd like to thank you very much for watching. Tomorrow we'll be back with a brand new episode. Until then, have a great night. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.